Thank you, Jerry. Hello and welcome to Jesus and Tim in Las Vegas. My name is Tim Barons, coming to you from the secret suicide capital of the United States of America, Las Vegas, Nevada, where suicides are never reported in the media unless it's a murder-suicide. What happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Well, God knows. Well, we're, uh, we're delighted to come your way every Saturday afternoon. Uh, Brandon will have today's program up on Jesus and Tim in Las Vegas on YouTube here shortly. You can also see some of the, uh, or hear some of the other interviews the Lord's allowed me to do over the years. One with Kurt and Brenda Warner. Kurt uh, was that quarterback who uh, at the Super Bowl in 2000 uh, was going to be interviewed by a reporter. And he said, first things first, thank you, Jesus. Uh, Kurt was very open about his faith and I so appreciate that, and it reminded me last week of the uh, the Super Bowl I saw with the uh, the Philadelphia Eagles. I could have cared less who was going to win that game until I found out that the quarterback was a believer and uh, the coach was a believer. I mean, when's the last time you heard a coach say, Lord Jesus Christ, when he wasn't swearing? I was so thrilled with uh, not only the coach and the quarterback, but uh, several of the other players uh, being outspoken about their faith. They have Bible studies. They've baptized some of the guys. I mean, it's just amazing what they've been allowed to do. And the the quarterback was uh, uh, studying to be in the ministry, and he got uh, the call to the NFL. But he's going to be going back to the ministry, I guess, uh, when uh, when his days at the NFL are, are finished. Well, um, I love Chick Publications. I've been handing out uh, Chick tracks for years. Uh, Jack Chick was a dear friend of mine ever since 1975. I had him, and he was popular then before his stand against uh, the horror of Revelation 17, uh, before the Alberto series. But uh, Jack and I used to talk every day for about five minutes at five o'clock, and he wanted to report on what the Lord was doing here in Las Vegas. And then when Jack passed away, uh, at the age of 92, about a year ago, David Daniels, his right-hand man, for several years took over, and he couldn't have passed it on to a better guy. Uh, David just super, and I just love David. And you know, here's, you hear about some of these organizations; they really go liberal after the or, or, or the, the fellow who founded it dies, but uh, like Charles Fuller, Fuller Seminary, and all. But uh, he's he's not that way. Dave, David's not that way. Last night we were on Fremont Street. Dan Fox, Mitch Inmore, and uh, and I handing out love. Of the Jewish people. And uh, we've handed this out. Uh, Mike Cahill and Janie and I have handed this out in Israel. We hand it out in Tel Aviv. No problem in Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. When you're handing it to the Orthodox, <laughs> sometimes your car will get surrounded. And uh, it's a little more difficult there. But the thing I like about this track, Love the Jewish People, by the way, you can uh, read it at chick.com. It gives the history of the Jews, gives the history of anti Semitism. And uh, how many people know that Adolf Hitler was a Catholic? Uh, you know, his right-hand men were all Roman Catholics. Um, he worked closely with the Jesuits. You can read that in Secret History of the Jesuits by Paris. It's available from Chick Publications. I mean, if you had somebody in your congregation that killed 12 million people, wouldn't you kick him out? I mean, the guy still hasn't been excommunicated. He, it's after all these years, Pope Pius XII never said anything critical about Hitler. But uh, then it has... Uh, the Messianic prophecies, and it, uh, see a lot of Jews think uh, the Catholics are Christians, and this uh, this points out that they clearly uh, are are following the wrong God, and uh, so uh, this is a wonderful track. Love the Jewish people. We'll be handing it out tonight on Fremont Street Experience, and you can read it at chick.com. But uh, it's a delight to have David Daniels on. He's written a number of books, and the one we're talking about today is Should a Christian Be a Mason? We like to avoid controversy on this program, and that's uh, why we're having David on again. God bless you, David. Thanks for being on uh, with uh, with uh, Jesus and Tim in Las Vegas. It's my pleasure, Tim. Why did you write, Should a Christian Be a Mason? Well, one, because people are asking that question. Uh, I once got a phone call here at Chick from a gentleman who called, and uh, he was interesting. He said... Uh, I'll, I'll clean up the speech. <laughs> he said, "I've been a I, 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 I have thirty. I say I'm a Freemason, and uh, for thirty something years ago, I said the prayer to receive Jesus, and I don't have to no, do another beep 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 thing." Mm. And wow. kind of hung up. He, he was rather upset. Wow. <laughs> so, what did you say to Norman Vincent Peale? 
<laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. No, he wasn't. Yeah, he was, but no. No, he was quite a quite an occultist, actually. Well, no, I wasn't able to say anything because he hung up. But actually, my great-grandfather, who was uh, a mayor of a local city out here, um, he was a Freemason. Mm. In fact, he founded the Chino Freemasons. He was the co-founder of it. Um, there's a, I have a picture of him with his lambskin, um, which is that little bib-looking thing right. that they wear. Right. But there's a lot of people who have asked the question about Freemasonry, and there's a lot of people who have said, oh, all that stuff you say against Freemasonry is wrong, it's a Christian organization. Well, then what is Freemasonry? And I didn't really want to write the book at first, but I prayed about it, and what the Lord put in my heart is, write it, figure it out. So the first thing I had to find out is, what are they? I mean, if you ask any, any Mason, you say, well, we're not a secret society, we are a society of secrets. Great. You haven't told me a whole lot there, but <laughs> th- then you say, well, where do you get your, where did you come from? Well, that's interesting. When I started researching where they came from, I found out that almost nobody seems to know where they came from. There's some basic stories, which I tell about at the beginning of the book. That at the beginning, there were real stonemasons. And if you're a stonemason, you make these big churches, and those big churches have giant arcs on them and various other neat arche- um, architectural things that if you don't make them right, they will fall down and kill people. Hmm. So you have to be sure that anybody who comes to your construction project actually knows his stuff. So the way they would connect with the other people is they would learn secret signs and symbols that they would pass on that only the people who learned a certain level could communicate to others that they also knew those architectural things that had been tested and proved and they were good architects. So as they were making all these churches and other buildings with that style of architecture, these masons were really important and that they knew their stuff and they, are, as they moved to higher levels, you know, the three basic levels, then they knew that they had good workers. And, but in the end of the 1550s, things started to, or so, things started to change when they put up their last uh, Gothic cathedral, uh, the last in the style of, of with the giant rocks, you know, that they're working on, the giant stones. And it kind of devolved down a little bit because there wasn't a lot of work, and it ended up becoming kind of a club so people would come in, and they eventually started letting rich people, because rich people have money, and they got to join in this club, and that was fun having secret names and little things, and, and they started developing it. But then after that, it started to change. As they became free and accepted Masons, they, they received people in, and that is when the occultic influence happened. Um, part of it was through the Jesuit order at the, at the, uh, at the uh, College of Clermont, there was a, a number of degrees that were added by the Jesuits, um, and there were other things that happened all through the six, later 1600s. Not early. That's why people say King James was a Mason. No, he wasn't. One, and one he couldn't have been, and two, he, he wasn't into secret societies like that, and uh, they can deal with that later. But in the seven, but the later 1600s and into the early 1700s is when it really got interesting as far as uh, where they were trying to cement down what their beliefs were. By 1717, when they got their first Grand Lodge in England, by that point, they had settled on certain degrees and a basic story. But by the mid-1800s, uh, mid that's where you get to this um, Civil War general and hero named Albert Pike. And his radical amount of reading and research into mysticism and Kabbalah and occultism and such made him the perfect guy to direct Freemasonry from that point on. And from there on out, it started taking on much more of an occultic kind of framework. And the proof of that are in the books that he wrote, and the most popular, of course, is Morals and Dogma, which is was used to be given to every Mason. And then now it's been shifted to another book called A Bridge to Light, which is kind of like um, Morals and Dogma Light. Mm. And so they go to this book, and they get their authoritative information about basics about what these different degrees are and what they mean. Mm. Well, um, let's say you have an uncle that's a Mason, and he's also professing to be a Christian. How would you reach him? Well, the first thing I'd find out is, 
does he have his Masonic Bible around? And then I'd like to show him what his Masonic Bible says, um, because his Masonic Bible is the King James Bible, and the King James Bible has the text right. They didn't change the text. They have all sorts of things at the beginning of the book that they talk about, and they only view the Bible as a secondary thing. They call it uh, part of the furniture of the Lodge. They don't consider it as authoritative. They consider it as a wedge to make you hold to your oaths. You swear on a Bible, you're going to keep your oath. If a Muslim swears on a Quran, he's going to keep his oath. That's the idea. It's furniture only. But they nonetheless have that Holy Bible, which is often called the Holy Bible, the Great Light and Masonry. That's one of the terms that they'll use for it. And then I'll show them some scriptures and talk to them about those things, but I'll also ask them about various rituals and things that they did in masonry that are well known because they're right there in Bridge to Light and in Morals and Dogma. That's where I want to start, because what are these things doing in something that's supposed to be Christian? That would where I'd, that's where I'd start it. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, do Muslim lodges swear on, uh, on the Quran to Allah? Yes, and so do certain uh, levels of masonry as well. And, and when you uh, move to the shrine, you, you swear on a Quran and you swear a, an oath that has to do with Allah. And, uh, and the Buddhists to uh, Buddha? and They can, yes. Uh, in fact, right, there's a guy named um, Joseph Fort Newton who was a minister, but he was a high-level mason, and in his book, which is included, some of his writings are actually included in the Masonic Bibles, he talks about that there are, he says like that uh, masonry knows what so many forget, that religions are many, but religion is one. Therefore, it invites to its altar men of all faiths, mm-hmm. knowing that if they use different names for the nameless one of a hundred names, yet they're praying to the one God and Father of all, knowing also that while they read different volumes, they're in fact reading the same vast book of the faith of man, as revealed in the struggle and sorrow of the race in its quest for God. So that, great and noble as the Bible is, Masonry sees it as a symbol of that eternal book of the will of God. Mm. So what would happen? You know, Jesus said to go into the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, We're either a missionary or a mission field. What would happen if a Mason in a Masonic Lodge started, a Christian Mason, Mason started sharing his his faith with another another individual in that Lodge who didn't know the Lord? Okay, now you're going to have some conflict between different kinds of Masons. There are certain ones who uh, say that they allow Jesus to be talked about like that, uh, as far as um, you know, worshiping Jesus and things like that. But as being the only way, the only truth, the only life, that would be different. Especially in most Masonic lodges, you could not get away with that. You could not uh, evangelize anybody else in Masonry. You would not be permitted to. Mm-hmm. Again, some people will say they do, but they're actually part of a specific kind of lodge that, that allows them to talk about Jesus. But when it really comes down to the Masonic writings, they'd say no, because they equate all, all these kind of books, um, the Bible, Old Testament, the Old Testament for Hebrews, Old and New for Christians, the Dhammapadra for the Mahayana sect of Buddhists, the Bhagavad Gita for Hindus, the Granth Sahib for Sikhs, the Quran for Muslims, and the Zend Avesta for Parsis and Zoroastrians. They all allude, they say, to a supreme deity. Wow. What about the oaths? Jesus warned in uh, Matthew five thirty four through 37 not to swear at all, neither by heaven, for it's God's throne, neither by the earth, it's his footstool, nor by Jerusalem, it's the city of the great king. Let your yes be yes and your nay, nay. What, uh, what do you say to that? What do they say to that? Well, you can go all the way back into the 1800s and read uh, some of the books that were even available at that time regarding Freemasonry, even before it was as far out as it is now, they talked about the issue of taking oaths, um, death oaths, and such, when the Lord says, let your yea be yea and your nay nay. That's true. But also, in your oath, it's what you say as well. What, not even in this oath, the oath pledge, whatever you want to call it. Mm-hmm. I'm in darkness and I want to be brought to the light, or this man here is in darkness and want to be brought to the light. Well, the Lord doesn't say that. He said that he's the light of the world. He that follows me shall not be in darkness. Mm-hmm. In the light of life. So you have this, this conflict 
that a person who calls himself a Christian is going to, wait a second, I have to go back in darkness again and say I'm in darkness? I'm not in darkness. I'm in the light. If we're in the light, as he is in the light, First John, then we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus the Son cleanses us from all sin. Mm-hmm. We're in the light. God doesn't like to be likened. Now, this is one of the big things I talk about in the book. God does not want to be likened to something else, anything else. Mm-hmm. For instance, he says in Isaiah 40, 25, um, to whom then will you liken me, or shall I be equal, says the Holy One. In verse uh, 46, verse 5 of Isaiah, to whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be like? And, of course, the answer is nobody. Mm-hmm. So then why do they have the sun and the moon, the triangle and the eye, uh, which is the sun and God, the eye of gold, um, the sun triangle and star, and uh, um the sun and moon is Osiris, all these Osiris and Iris things, Isis things, Hermes, Mercury, uh, Thoth, the morning of the sun. Now let me jump to that one, the morning of the sun, because that deals with the book of Ezekiel, and that's where I would take a Christian. See, a candidate enters the tabernacle in utter darkness and silence, a reminder of death. This is a quote. He hears the lamentations and sorrow associated with the deaths of selected deities. Listen, Osiris of Egypt... Kama of India, Mithra of Persia, Addis of Phrygia, Tammuz of Phoenicia. Their deaths symbolize the temporary victory of darkness and evil over the light. The mythologies associated with all these deities tell of both their death and resurrection. Brethren, enacting ancient drama, this is again containing the quote, mourn Osiris, who is a representative of the sun, of light, life, good, and beauty. They reflect the way in the earth, uh, they reflect upon the way of the earth may again be gladdened by its presence. Attempts may be made to bring life to the dead Osiris with the grip of the apprentice, the symbol of science, and with the grip of fellowship, a symbol of logic. So the candidate for the 24th degree of masonry goes into a room decorated with symbols designed to make him feel like he entered into an ancient ceremony, and he hears people weeping for the deaths of selected deities. You heard what they were? Isis, Kama, Mithra, Addis, um, Tammuz. All these men are mourning for them, and they're making these sound effects in the background. But what did God say in Ezekiel 8, verses 13 to 14? He he said also unto me, Turn thee yet again, and thou shalt see greater abominations that they do in the temple. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which is toward the north, and behold, there sat women weeping for Tammuz. It's an abomination to weep for the death of Tammuz, and yet they're walking into this in their 24th degree in a ceremony. Hmm. How can you be a Christian and do something that God calls very clearly in Ezekiel 8 an abomination? You know, uh, we're talking with David Daniels, who's uh, written a book entitled "Can a Christian or Should a Christian Be a Mason?" You can uh, you can pick it up through Chick dot com. Billy Graham, probably one of the greatest evangelists who ever lived. uh, I used to read the news for him and his radio station, WFGW, WMITFM in Black Mountain, North Carolina, back in 1971. Um, and yet, I, I was doing an interview with a fellow who was a 33rd, former 33rd degree Mason who had become a believer, written a book about it, and he said that he was at the ceremony where Billy Graham got, got sworn in as a Mason. Why in the world, if what you're saying is true, would Billy Graham, one of the greatest evangelists who ever lived, why would he be a Mason? Well, first of all, is he really a Freemason? Well, one day I got a book called The History of Freemasonry, Its Legendary Origins. It's an 1800s book by Albert Gallatin Mackey, and it was republished in 2010. And uh, it's right here. I have a 1996 introduction. It's a 2010 uh, copy of the book. I'm holding it in my hand. And right here on the jacket cover, approved as a Masonic book, it says... George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, John Hancock, Mark Twain, Henry Ford, Billy Graham, Arnold Palmer, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, Franz Joseph Haydn, Voltaire, Johann Wolfgang von Goethe, Tony Blair, all are Freemasons. Why? Why would Billy Graham be a Freemason? One thing that happened to a lot of people is they wanted to get positions in life, they wanted to move up, they had to be a part of a fraternal order. And there's a point where people seem to want to put away their brains. They want to separate part of their brain on one side and part of their brain on the other side. And they make like, their faith, their beliefs on one side, and then their, this is just a club, this is just an order, and they excuse it to themselves. 
and they put that on the other side. The problem with that is they're actually enacting the things that God says don't enact. Mm -hmm. They're bowing in front of the things they should not bow. They are they are um, reading the books that tell them that the secrets of their own belief, there's this system that'll get them to heaven, are based on the works of Freemasonry. I can't remember. And of course, Go ahead. i got to get to the dirty secret. Yeah. We only have a little time. I want to get to the dirty secret really fast. That's the, the, the latter chapter of the book that I wasn't even going to do, and that is Baphomet. Ironically, it is on page 66 that it starts. And it literally, people have said, and Mason has said continually, Baphomet is just a, a red herring. They say, this is this guy, um, and this 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 uh, hoaxer guy in the 1800s, and he admitted it was a lie and at the end and came back. Actually, it has nothing to do with that guy, Leo Taxel. It has to do with another guy named Eliphas Levi. For three years, I thought, there's got to be a connection between this between masonry and Eliphas Levi. Well, the drawing of Baphomet that you see is by Eliphas Levi. Um, that's not his real name. Elif, uh, uh, Eliphas Levi Zached is not his... Anyway, we can go on to that later. But the bottom line is this guy who brought about um, this drawing of the Baphomet also wrote a whole bunch of occultic books. And because I was collecting stuff on on Pike, I found one of the books in his library. It's in the listing. And I checked it out. It was in French. So that means the stuff that he quotes from him, he is translating himself from French into English in his Masonic book. And what he did was quote a section that if you read the whole part, which is in this book, in my book, you will see that Baphomet is both Jesus is Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost, and Satan. Mm, wow. Wow. Well, the book is called Should a Christian Be a Mason by David Daniels. You need to pick it up. Um, I loved Adrian Rogers. I used to watch him every Sunday. I met him uh, when we went down to see his uh, church there in, in, in Memphis. And I was so impressed with him. He spent several minutes talking with us. But when I talked to him, when we were doing uh, Mornings with Tim and Al on uh, KBRT in, in L.A. Or, or maybe it was in St. Louis, I brought up masonry. And you can clearly tell he did not want to talk about it. Uh, why won't more pastors address this issue? Because people who donate to their church and have lots of money are Freemasons. It's just the way it is. Jack found that. In fact, he, he went to his Baptist church and one day and found that after he'd written one of his tracts that all the Masons had taken the Masonic rings off their fingers. <laughs> mm, wow. But every time a person came up to be saved, the pastor then showed him to that Mason, and that Mason turned the fire away from that brand new convert and turned them into Masons. Wow. Oh, that's so sad, so sad. You need to get this, folks. Should a Christian be a Mason by David Daniels? You can get it through chick.com. David, uh, we only have a couple minutes left. What are some other books and uh, comic books that are available right now through Chick Publications tracks that you recommend? Well, we have a whole selection, of course. We have the entire comic series. You go to www.chick.com in your phone, on your computer, whatever. You can see all the books that we have. I've written a whole bunch on the King James Bible and how we can trust them. Um, we've written, we have a number of books on masonry in our selection, and the ones that we have, I've gotten to go through and check their data. The data is good. So um, we only sell the ones that we really approve of, when we, and I got to check them. Um, we have lots of comics that reach teenagers. That's what's good. Look at the Crusader series for teenagers. Yeah. And we just have a whole selection of comics. All of them are online. The, the tracks are all online. I mean, you can look them up and see them for yourself. And listen, friends, if you have teenagers around the house, get some of these comic books and leave them around the house. Uh, when the kids come in with their friends, they'll be picking them up and reading them. And Chick Tracks, Get Read. You have a wonderful DVD called, I think it's The Light of This World, Light of the World. The Light of the World. What? Uh -huh. Briefly tell us about that, 30 seconds. It's a 78-minute Chick Track with beautiful art by artist Fred Carter and a couple others with beautiful music by and uh, narration that takes you through the gospel. And the first time it was shown in Mexico, 1,200 Mexican brothers and sisters were added to the faith. 
my sister and I are going to go to a couple of Mexican cities. And I tell you, I, I love handing out Mary's kids in Mexico because people see Mary and then they see these children around there. They assume it's their kids. They don't they don't think of Jesus' brothers and sisters. The Bible says that Mary was a virgin until uh, Jesus was born, Matthew one twenty five. But boy, they cross themselves with a <laughs> color. But I tell you, they read it and uh, very few uh, come up and complain. I did have one man in Mexico City uh, come up to me. He said, I'm a Catholic, not a Christian. And I thought, well, that's why I'm there, you know. <laughs> but uh, David Daniels, uh, check it out, uh, chick.com, dear friend, Chick Publications, wonderful saints. They pray for us as we're out on Fremont Street Experience and on the bridges here. And uh, we're going to meet the fruits of our labor, and we're going to meet Jack Chick one of these days. Uh, there's Amen. probably a longer line to meet Jack Chick in heaven than there is the Apostle Paul with a number of <laughs> tracks that went out. But uh, David Daniels, thank you so much for, uh, for being with us today. God bless you, brother. God bless you. Have a great day. Right, you too. Bye-bye. Thank you so much, my friend. Be praying for my sister and I as we head to, uh, to Mexico for a couple of, well, about five days or so. Pray for the tracks getting out for the folks who will be sitting in for me. God bless you. Live for the Lord. Bring them all A's. Bye-bye. Sunshine Gospel.